My guest this evening is the Dean of Education at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, Professor Tabu Msibi, as we continue with our conversation. Professor, the head of NSFAS, yes, uh, Mr. Sizwe Nglasana, has resigned suddenly. It was not expected that he would resign. But we've also learned that there are problems with the system. From your experience, where you sit as the Dean of Education, what is going on with NSFAS? So I, I, I must admit, I, I, do, I do have an opinion on this, but uh, I must flag that I would deal very little with NEFSAS because this would be mainly the responsibility of student funding, which is a different wing outside, outside uh, schools and, faculty and, and colleges within the university. But I, I think they, there has been a degree of mismanagement within NEFSAS uh, in that, uh, uh, from what I follow in the media, a number of students uh, have not been paid. Uh, we're fortunate at the University of KwaZulu-Natal that the university has made certain contingencies and students are receiving their meal allowances. Uh, so th that has not actually had a direct bearing on, on our, our own institution. But I understand that there have been serious problems uh, with the system in many universities across the country. Um, and of course, uh, we, you know, we, must, we must also understand uh, and, and, and be sympathetic to some extent to NEFSAS because you will recall that um, you know, NEFSAS used to be a loan. And all of a sudden, at the end of 2017, uh, the fee-free education was announced, and they had to change their whole their systems altogether. So we, we must also appreciate the sort of the complexities that they've had to deal with, uh, integrating systems and making sure that things operate accordingly. But of course, uh, that's not an excuse. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Mr. Masana has tried very much to address some of the challenges, and I, I suppose. Uh, he felt that uh, it was uh, time for somebody else to try and, and continue with uh, improving NEFSAS. Well, our education system is very complex, right? The entire system is not only a tertiary level. So I'm going to look at other parts of the education system whilst you continue with the mission of decolonizing education at tertiary level. I want to hear your views on this. Mm -hmm. I have read a little bit on what's going on in Japan, in South Korea, Finland, at least those three countries and their education system. What, what do you think they are doing right that we mm -hmm. could be doing and are not doing? Because money is, is, is still an issue in South Africa, but it's not, complete, it's not the only problem. And we do not seem to be getting good value for the investments that we make in education. What do you think is happening? Right. I mean, I, I, I think uh, I'm going to separate um, Finland and, and South Korea and Japan because I think they, their systems, although are achieving the same sort of results, uh, but their, their strategies are quite different. Um, you know, the Finnish system is based on focusing on the child. Um, it's less testing. Uh, it's less testing and more focus on actually empowering the child to be able to develop sufficiently across the system. Whereas the other systems are about rigorous testing, benchmark, benchmarking standards and that type of thing. Um, I, I think we've gone more the South Korea strategy where we, we, we're doing a lot of of uh, uh, testing, uh, you know, through the ANA uh, uh, test that we, we, we present to our, gra our grade, uh, uh, grade um, uh, th fours and, 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 and grade nines. Uh, but what is happening currently, uh, in, in terms of looking at the entire system, uh, we have not, I think, got capacity at the level of resourcing, and I'm talking about physical infrastructural resources here and human resources, to be able to sufficiently impact on the education system in a positive way. What do I mean by this? I mean that uh, we have a system historically that has deliberately sought to disadvantage black people. Um, and uh, with 1994, there was a, a radical mission by the department and the state to try and empower teachers through a range of training opportunities so that you had qualified teachers in the system. But of course, we forget that often uh, the change takes a long time. And so we have a lot of s teachers in the system that are not necessarily um, fit p for purpose. And I, what do I mean by that? I mean, they, they're not able to deliver the curriculum in ways that would bring about the radical transformation, the critical thinking that we want from our children. Um, I mean, I, I think we made, and I'm going to be controversial in saying this, I think we made an error by getting rid of OBE, uh, but I could understand why, because our teachers were not able to uh, offer an education system that offered critical thinking because they themselves were not at that level. So what we've done now, we've, in, we've 
replace OBE with CAPS, which is a far more rigid curriculum structure, uh, which expects teachers to attain certain levels uh, or to teach at, at set second, a certain pace, attain certain levels of or outcomes at the end of the day. But ultimately, all of that takes power away from the teacher. So the teacher is no longer seen as a professional. The teacher is just simply an implementer of a set curriculum. And I think there's a problem there, because what you want, which is what the Finnish model does, is it, it focuses on the teacher as a professional. And it's saying that this person has the competencies, has the skill to be able to deliver quality education. And we must not focus on just testing the child, but rather on comprehension and, and making sure that the child has understood as opposed to just uh, testing for cramming, you know, because well, that's mm. what actually ends up happening. We mm. test so that kids go, they cram whatever they've learned, and then they pass. And then they come to higher education, they fail dismally because they don't know what they're talking about. We're not teaching for critical thinking. And that is at, at the heart of the problems with our education system. We have not sufficiently empowered our kids to think critically. And as we move into the fourth industrial revolution, we're going to have, uh, we're going to find it more difficult because there's a resource problem. Yes, granted, our schools battle in terms of resources. But apart from the resources, uh, it's critical that we offer an education system that would enable kids to be entrepreneurs if they want to, to be innovators, to be people who are going to drive the change agenda that we want. At the moment, it's about repetition, it's about regurgitation, it's about recall. And that's where the problem is, for me, at least. Yeah, well, and I'm going to use you as an example. I want you to, to tell us a bit more about yourself. Now, education does not take place in isolation. It takes place within communities and in a particular context, as much as the quality of the teacher and the curriculum is very important. What do you make of the level of discipline mm -hmm. in our schools and the support that communities, especially in the black areas, uh, that the schools receive from the communities? And what has your personal experience been over the years? Yeah, uh, you know, you're asking a very critical question uh, here, Tim, because I think um, we often blame teachers and the schooling system for its failure to assist children to be successful. But of course, Parents have a critical role to play. The community has a critical role to play. And often what you find, you know, uh, I, my parents uh, and, 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 uh, 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 and other community members of Escort, where I'm from, would speak of this idea that you are our child, regardless of whether you are from CB uh, family, you belong to a community and that community owns you. Muntung, muntung, and you're part of that community. And the community can have actually a role uh, to play in disciplining you. It doesn't matter whether your parents are around or not because you are part of the community. We don't have that anymore and we often keep quiet when if, even when we see things going wrong. You know, I was outside education, just to give you an example, I was seeing uh, two days ago a clip um, in, of a person in Durban being robbed in daylight in front mm. of everybody uh, and everyone just stands back the person gets robbed and and then the robbers run away and it just continues like that and nobody does anything about it because we've lost that sense of connection the sense of humanness um, but 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 having said that um, one of the things that we're trying to do at the University of KwaZulu Natal is precisely to address what you are talking about so we are we're having a colloquium in fact in two, two weeks time from the 21st to the 23rd of August that is looking at corporal punishment within the schooling system. Why are we looking at corporal punishment within the schooling system? We're saying that universities do not operate in, in, in isolation. You know, they're part of communities and we need to be able to address what is happening at basic education level. We want to bring various stakeholders to have serious conversations about the issue of discipline in our schools. We want unions to be represented, teachers, parents, government, uh, the seaters, everybody to be around the table and the learners themselves. And let's start having a productive conversation about how do we get our schools to function? Because without discipline, we create a situation of dysfunctionality where teachers are even afraid of going into the classroom space. And of course, we pass legislation and we say, no, um, we're no longer going to have corporal punishment in our schooling system. Uh, and of course, we know that <laughs> in, in some schools, uh, teachers still actually continue administering corporal punishment. Mm. But teachers often feel that they don't have an alternative to corporal punishment. Then they resort to corporal punishment because they don't see any other alternative. Of course, the department sure. has tried to, bro to provide other alternatives to corporal punishment, but they don't know about it. So so communities and everyone, every other person that is operating or existing within a particular community has a role to play in the education system and has a role now, to play in informing what happens within our schools. And it is our responsibility of ensuring that. Prof, obviously the community of Escort is very proud of you, having achieved what you have. 
and uh, South Africa generally would be pleased that it has a head of the School of Education in your person and at your age. Your personal experience and uh, lessons that you've learned that you can pass on to younger people who also want to stay in the game and become educated, what are those? Now you're a professor of education. Young people are not sure how to <laughs> go about planning their futures, especially when it comes to their, ac their academic development. Mm -hmm. So, so w one of the first thing I want to say is, you know, uh, there's a saying, uh, 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 often we, we sit folding our arms and expecting things to fall from the sky. Uh, and, 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 and somehow through God's divine intervention, things will happen. It's never worked, it's, not, it's never quite like that. So the first thing is to appeal to people's individual agency. It is upon you as an individual to shape your own destiny. So this idea that we need to rely a lot on government and other people to play uh, uh, some role in assisting us and supporting us, yes, uh, other people have a role to play, but it starts with you. So that's the first thing. It starts with you. You need to decide and you need to have a clear vision about where you want to see yourself in the future. The second thing is that you can't get there, and I, and I may appear to be contradicting myself here, you can't get there without the help of others. So you need mentorship. You need opportunity. So by saying that it starts with you, I'm saying you also need to find those avenues yourself those people yourself who may play a role in your mentorship, in your own development. Mm. So I often speak about my mentor who is Crispin Hampson. When I first arrived at the University of KwaZulu Natal as a first year student in 2002, he said to me, you are going to become an academic. At that stage, I just wanted to become a teacher. I didn't know that one could uh, become an academic through sure. further studies, publishing and, and that type of thing. But he said to me, you're going to become an academic and I'm going to assist you in that. So Crispin, for instance, when I applied to go to the United States, was instrumental in looking through my application, uh, making sure that what I had written was grammatically uh, coherent and was tight enough for consideration in, in, in another country. Well, so you need those people who are going to shape your thinking. And as they say, the rest is history and uh, there you are. Now we are uh, talking to you and uh, getting your insights on how we can improve the education system in South Africa. Well done to you and everything of the best. Thank you so much, sir. Much appreciated. And that's Professor Tabum Sibi, the Dean of Education at University of KwaZulu-Natal. And thank you for having been our guest, as well as thank you at home for having been with us on the Mudise Network. And make sure to tune in tomorrow night, as I will be talking to the Statistician General of South Africa, Risenga Maluleka. So, Looking forward to that one tomorrow evening.